Hello and welcome back to INMR, where in today's podcast I'm going to be previewing England's quarterfinal match against Switzerland taking place on Saturday. So far for England this tournament it's been pretty woeful and this is sort of their now or never. Switzerland are looking in really good form, they've just come off the back of a 2-0 win against Italy. So what I'm going to be doing today is going over each side's tactics, predicting the lineups, showing what I'd prefer to use versus what I think is going to happen with the starting lineup, and of course my score prediction as well. So if we get straight into it with England's current form, which obviously, looking at it right now, two wins, two draws, but overall throughout this tournament it's been really, really poor football being played. That 2-1 win was obviously an extra time by the skin of our teeth, that last minute equaliser from Jude Bellingham. Denmark really poor, Slovenia I thought was even worse. Obviously Serbia on the opening day we didn't really know what was ahead. Switzerland on the other hand, despite having the same results, have been far better in terms of their playing style. They look they look like a proper team, you know people say they look like a club rather than a national team of a collection of players who are under loads of different systems throughout the season. Everyone in that Swiss team understands the idea that the managers put forward to them and they're executing it really well. A a massive draw against Germany. It's not easy to get a result against them at the moment. And then that win against Italy, uh, where really it was a masterclass. If we take a look at England's tactics, it feels at the minute like there isn't any, but the idea that I think is supposed to be happening is what I've sort of gone with for this tactical explanation. So obviously England play their 4-2-3-1 formation where the wingers and striker drop deep to receive. The problem here is that when we are dropping, it's leaving no players in attack. You know, if Kane's dropping, you don't need both wingers doing it as well, but that is what's happening. And then Bellingham in the 10 isn't making that run in behind where Kane has left that space open. When defending it remains in that 4-2-3-1 shape, but I feel like whenever England have taken the lead, we've seen a back five suddenly being used. The approach has been really safe so far. I mean, it's not paid off because it's it's not like England have felt safe in terms of getting through to the next round during the tournament, but it's safe in that it lacks tempo. No one's really willing to take a risk and it's just really boring football to watch at the moment. Switzerland, on the other hand, have been phenomenal to watch. They build up in a 4-3-3 with the eights dropping low to play through the press. This can adapt to a 3-4-3 as well, where of course you then just have one of the defenders coming up into midfield to create overloads in the centre. It's a very fluid side with loads of little movements being made, including midfielders and wingers switching place. In order to create space, as you can see, Obisha here has come inside and that will allow Shaka to go and exploit the space on the wing because Abisha has dragged his marker in. So they're essentially swapping positions to create space but that is really confusing defences at the moment. Shaka has a key role which I'm going to get onto a bit more later on when talking about the Italy game. You know he essentially links the play together. He is that bit in the middle between defence and attack and he's performing his role really well. In attack Switzerland overload the box when in front of goal. It's very high tempo football and it's something that I think is going to wear England out very quickly. So if we look at Switzerland versus Italy, there's this graphic on screen now which is really well displayed by The Athletic and it's looking at Switzerland's aggressive press out of possession and how it's forcing errors. This is causing lots of high regains that's allowing Switzerland to pretty much shoot straight after winning the ball back because of how high they're winning the ball. This aggressive pressing style really did suffocate Italy. And once again, because of how slow and lethargic England are playing, they're only going to be even more successful with this pressing style in the quarterfinals. Vargas made his mark with a strong performance and a man of the match award against Italy, but in my opinion, it was Shaka who really deserved a lot of plaudits for his performance. He's the one connecting the lines, as I say, controlling the tempo, recycling possession. And if we take a look at his pass map against Italy, you can see that he is the one making them passes from all areas of the pitch. Lots of varying distances as well, but he's the one connecting defence to attack. And another performance like he had in the round of 16 he's gonna blow Gareth Southgate's side out of the water because he's just everywhere connecting everything together making sure everything ticks over so that Switzerland can be as successful as they have been. Moving on to England versus Slovakia as I said looks really lethargic low tempo the passing errors in abundance again which obviously led to Mark Gahey's yellow card He received a pass from, I believe, Trippier, which forced Gehi into making that foul, and now he is suspended for this game. There are only two shot on targets in the match, and they came from the goals. Obviously, the first one coming in the 95th minute when Jude Bellingham equalised. 
which obviously means there was no shot on target in the first half. And this was the first time this has happened in a knockout match at a major tournament for England since 1986, which shows how restricted they were by Slovakia. And this is going to be the same case against Switzerland. The problem for me is, apart from England not really having a playing style, it's that the players in the starting lineup aren't being used correctly. Foden doesn't succeed in the left wing, he'd be much better centrally, um, and Trippier in particular is being read really easily due to him being a right-footed player at left back. Whenever he receives the ball, he can't receive it on his back foot on his left and take a positive touch forward towards Foden. He has to always come back inside because it would be easier for him to make that pass with his right foot. So automatically, the Slovakian players knew exactly what Trippier was going to do. They knew that Foden wasn't a problem because he's not able to quickly receive it on his back foot and then play that positive pass forward into Foden because it's not his strong foot. He's not going to be able to do it at the pace, at the quality that he's able to do it if he was on the right-hand side. So that's an issue. And of course, as I say, he is one of a variety of players who aren't being used correctly. The most frustrating thing was that after Kane got the goal to put England ahead in the first minute of extra time, Southgate reverted straight back to this 10 men behind the ball idea and using a back five. He's pretty much scrapped the 4-2-3-1 and gone for this 5-3-2 and at times this was even a 5-4-1 where Kane would obviously come back as he does and you'd only have Tony up front and it's just such a negative style overall because it just shows no intent of pushing for that extra goal. You know, they scored immediately so they spent the remainder of the half hour of extra time just absorbing pressure in this back five formation, which by the way, Switzerland, I believe, will break this down easily because all it takes is for one player to interchange with another. England not really sure what they're going to do because they don't want to follow up on players. They don't want to... It's like they don't want to run, almost. So there is going to be a player left behind. Simple ball into that free man and it's game over. So if we take a look at my preferred 11 first and then I'll explain what I think actually is going to happen. So for me, this is how I would set up against Switzerland. In goal, Jordan Pickford, don't have a problem with that. Back four of Joe Gomez, Lewis Dunk, John Stones and Carl Walker. Carl Walker, I'm happy for him to push up because I think he's been a lot more successful in attack. I'd allow for him to push forward and provide more up the wing with Saka. Put Joe Gomez at left back because I think he's done it really well at Liverpool at points throughout the season and I just think Trippier needs to go whether he's fit or not. It's just not working and I think Gomez could do a really good job there because we've seen him succeed in the Premier League with that. What having Joe Gomez there allows as well is for a back three to be created so that when Walker does push up to contribute in attack the rest of the back four shuffles to make a back three. Um, Lewis Dunk is in there purely because I just love to see him make his debut at a major tournament. I'm not stupid I'm pretty aware that Cons is going to start over him but you know it's called preferred 11 for a reason I would love to see Lewis Dunk. Walker goes up it shuffles into a back three I'd like Bellingham to be a bit more defensive minded. Um, I think in order to accommodate Foden being inside, that means that Bellingham needs to come back a bit. I don't mind him being more advanced, but I would prefer to see him just a little bit further back um, to support Declan Rice, which obviously means that Foden will be playing in his best position. Cole Palmer out on the left. He needs to play for me. Um, I don't want to put him on the right because I can't justify not playing Saka because I think he's been England's brightest spot in attack this tournament and up top Harry Kane I'm doing this reluctantly with Harry Kane because there's no denying that he's such a good goal scorer but he's just not been good enough in all other areas for me so I'm sort of given the benefit of the doubt because it could be the service that's being provided because the other attacking players aren't in their preferred areas of the pitch but I'd say if at half time during this game Kane still hasn't made an impact and you know it's not the service because the players are where they should be and the players that I think should be playing are on the pitch then bring them off for Ollie Watkins or Ivan Tony. just switch it up a bit because I do believe they deserve their chance I prefer Watkins I think he's a better goal scorer but there's no denying that Tony did have a good impact against Slovakia moving on to what I think Gareth Southgate will go for. There's just one change and it's Esri Konza for Mark Gahey. It's a forced change, obviously, because Gahey's suspended. It's just very safe all over again. Expect late subs, that's all we've seen so far. Trippier would stay in, so I think we'd have more tr troubles down the left-hand side. Konza favoured over Dunk. I, I do think Konza's a good defender, so I see that. And the only positive in this for me, in this side, is that Mainu doesn't get dropped, which unfortunately I have to do 
in my preferred 11 in order to accommodate Bellingham staying on. But in this year, Manu gets to feature and I do think he's been very good as well as Saka. So to round this off then, my score prediction, um, it's not a good one. I think we're going to get blown out the water. I think Switzerland will win 3 0. I think, unfortunately, Southgate's stubbornness in his selection is what's going to cost England. And I think such a well drilled team, such as Switzerland, are just going to run rings around a really poor, boring, tired, by the looks of things, England side. And it's not going to be pretty on Saturday, in my opinion. That is when we're going to end today's podcast, but there's plenty more you can go and listen to. As well as that, there's loads of articles on my website which you can go and read. Match reports, interviews, analysis pieces. There's so much, especially um, Euro-related content at the moment. So go and check that out. That is inmrfootball.co.uk. I'm also on both Instagram and X, so you can follow me on there. Thank you very much for listening, and I will see you in the next one.